This Freedom Stories discussion is being recorded for use by the International Storytelling Center, ISC. This recording will be owned and managed by ISC and will be used for any educational purpose that ISC deems appropriate. By participating in this public discussion, you acknowledge this recording and its subsequent uses. Closed captioning is provided today by ACS. Freedom Stories, Unearthing the Black Heritage of Appalachia is proudly supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and produced by the International Storytelling Center. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Union is behind us. We shall not be moved. The union is behind us. We shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water.
that's planted by the war. Water, we shall not be
Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Freedom Stories public discussion. I'm Alice Dean Turley, Director of the International Storytelling Center Freedom Stories Project. And today our topic is the Civil Rights Movement, another timely freedom story to highlight the overlooked aspects of American history in an effort to illuminate how we came to be the America we recognize today. As an NEH funded project, Freedom Stories brings together the folk art of storytelling with humanity scholarship. This approach has the intent of guiding the public through a deeper appreciation of the role of African Americans in the creation of American culture. The International Storytelling Center is fortunate to be able to produce this work through a grant uh, received from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is the major funding funder of the Freedom Stories Project. As always, today's discussion is recorded and along with all prior Freedom Stories discussions, uh, they can be found to, on YouTube, the International Storytelling Center webpage and Facebook page and it's open to the general public. So if you miss something, you can always access it later. If you have any questions or comments for me or the panel, please feel free, free to text us on the Facebook page and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can and as time permits. So we begin today as we always do with the benefit of a storyteller to share important aspects from humanities through storytelling. So today we're fortunate to have join us as our musician, educator, and storyteller, Reggie Harris. Reggie Harris is a deeply rooted singer, songwriter, storyteller, and cultural ambassador known worldwide for his ability to inspire hope and create opportunities for building community and positive change. Reggie uses his strong and resonant voice along with an effervescent stage presence and his vibrant smile to bring history and his personal stories to life. As a 12 year liver transplant survivor and a descendant of a slave owner and one of his enslaved women, Reggie is a unique bridge for engaging the dialogue of racial healing and activism. His performances and recordings have led to a growing movement of courageous conversations on race, history, and the interactions of healing across the nation. His latest CDs are ready to go, produced in 2018, Deeper Than the Skin, 2020, and Solid Ground, which is his latest production. Please welcome to our sharing and music storytelling part of our discussion, storyteller, musician, and educator, Reggie Harris. Thank you, Alistine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Well, everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Turn me round. Turn 
turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. These are some of the songs that I heard in my youth. I was born in 1952. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the city of brotherly love, as they referred to it in those days. I don't hear that said very much. Brotherly and sisterly love have, well, they are in short supply in our nation today. And yet those songs form the backbone, the freedom songs that came out of a people who were struggling for freedom and justice in a nation founded on the principles of freedom. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, in my early years, of course, I realized that growing up in my neighborhood that was 98% uh, black, that there were other neighborhoods in Philadelphia and that we were not equal. The, the messages came early. And they came in a variety of ways. One day, my mother took me to the hospital after I had cut myself, my knee, playing a game of running bases. And she took me to that hospital. And as we walked into that building, we passed this large board with lots of pictures on it. And I looked up at that board. She had me by the hand. She was rushing me to the emergency room. But I saw that board and I wondered, I asked her, who are those people? Well, all of those faces, some 40 or 50 of them, were the important people for the hospital, the board of directors, the, the surgeons, the, the trustees, and all of those faces were white, as were most of the faces that we were shown growing up in Philadelphia, in our school, in our neighborhood, and in the papers, and anywhere that people were talking about important things, most of the faces were white. We were learning early on that we were other, that having brown skin was not necessarily an asset in America. As a matter of fact, we found out later that it was no asset at all. But it's still, in my church, the Nazarene Baptist Church at Nice and Light Comic Street, that's how they taught us to say it in those days, is that say the name of your church like you're proud of it and tell people where it is in case they want to drop by. <laughs> Well, I don't know that anybody dropped, anybody dropped by the church because I told them where it was because most of the time I didn't want to be there myself. I was a little boy. Sunday mornings were treasured. We thought we could get up and watch cartoons and have fun before we had to go back to school on Monday. But my mother, Helen Harris, had other plans. She had plans that had been made long before any of us were born because she knew that on Sunday mornings we had to gather with the folks. We had to go to that church and sit and hear those old folks, as we called them in those days, sing those old songs and take all day doing it. And we were in that church and we were singing songs that would later be part of the grounding, the grounding that would prepare us for life in America. Wait in the water. Oh, wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Well, who were those children on the dress in red? I say, God's going to trouble the water. They must be the ones that Moses led. God's going to trouble the water. You better wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. They were singing the spirituals, the sorrow songs, as Frederick Douglass called them, the songs that, that stirred the hearts of African Americans who realized that their bondage could be taken on. They found themselves here, brought as resource to this nation that was fixated on the idea of freedom. And yet, by the time of the Civil War, of course, there were over four million of us in slavery. And those old folks, they knew that our lives, us young people thinking that we, we had everything available to us, they knew that our lives were going to be hard. They were singing those songs and they were sharing their testimonies about how life had to be taken on. 
This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Well, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Well, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Well, the world didn't give it so the world can't take it away. We wondered why these old folks were singing songs about having a joy that the world wanted to take away. But we didn't know that they were grounding us. They were giving us music and stories that would seep into our bones because the ancestors, those who had come before, those who came in 1619 and after and found themselves in bondage began to sing and they began to collect their stories. They saw and heard in those stories that they were read to from the Bible about a man named Moses. And when they sang, let my people go, they were not only singing about the Moses of the scriptures, they were singing about Harriet Tubman. And they were singing about all those who worked on the Underground Railroad who would indeed help over 200,000 to escape. Of course, 4 million versus 200,000. Well, the journey and the work was going to be hard and long. And as we know, the journey and the work continues today. And as I grew up and I absorbed those songs, I have to say that you, we called them the old folks, but now in my present incarnation, I have to just think about how old those old folks were. <laughs> Times change and I find myself as being one of those elders who's sharing the song and the stories to give a whole new generation or generations of young people a little bit of what I got from those folks. And then it was in 1963, on August 28th, when I was outside playing with my friends and I heard my mother call. She called Reggie and I, I didn't respond right away because we were having too much fun. We were all the way up the street. But then my mother, as she was wont to do, called out, Reginald Samuel Harris, get your butt down here. That's how she talked to me when she got serious. She used my full name. And I said to my friends, I gotta go. I didn't know what she wanted, but what she wanted was for me to come into the house and watch TV. Now that was an unusual thing in the middle of the day, but what she wanted me to see was an event that was happening in Washington, DC. She wanted me to see the March on Washington and, and sitting in front of that TV set, and I have to tell young people all the time, TV then was not like TV now. I mean, it was only about that big, <laughs> made of glass, and there were only three, three stations and two colors. They can't wrap their brains around that. However, there we were, sitting there watching all of those singers and speakers and 250,000 people on the mall in DC. I am so honored today that I, I know that Chuck Neblett was one of those young people. We saw him earlier in that, that uh, video, singing with the Freedom Singers. And it's probably on that day that I heard some of those songs for the first time. I don't, in my 11 year old brain, remember all of that on that day, but I know that seeing those people and hearing Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom and ain't going to let nobody turn me around. It began to seep in that there was a job to do. It was a job that I would not embrace until years later as I became a musician and began to also experience on trips around America that having brown skin was not an asset in America. It was then that I began to learn those same facts that you saw on your screen as those panels went by, because that was not shared with us as I grew up in school. Those were not the lessons of history, and yet history was living all around us. And hearing the words of people like Langston Hughes, who said, hold fast to dreams, for when dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. With billowing sails, the galleons came, bringing men and dreams and women and dreams. Some were free hands seeking a greater freedom. Some were indentured hands hoping to find their freedom. Some were slave hands guarding in their hearts the seed of freedom. But one word was there always, and that word was freedom. The man whose picture is on my shirt today said that the problem of the 20th century 
is of race. Well, the problem of every century in America has been a problem of race. And we have been struggling and wading through this water for over 400 years. And indeed, the songs and the stories, the stories. My first visit to the Highlander Center came in the 1990s. It was there that I discovered the, the history of that great place. And one of my mentors, Pete Seeger, who was the reason that I went, because he had been there so many times sitting and singing with people from different places in America, people of different colors, black and white, coming to meet to figure out how we could make this a more perfect union. And so as I went there and I absorbed what happened, and then years later, as I had the opportunity to sit in a room with Rosa Parks and to hear her give her story, I realized that I had a piece of this too. And a lot of what those old folks taught me in those early days began to come alive. And certainly as I sit here today, after more than a year of a pandemic and social unrest in America, I see clearly what my mission is. It has been this for over 40 years, but I stand on the shoulders and I follow in the footsteps of many, some of them here today, who have been fighting this fight, who have been tying together the threads that we need and also sacrificing themselves. All of those great icons and many whose names will never hit the history books. Those who were indeed the backbone of the civil rights movement, which of course continues today. As I sat here in my living room last year and seeing people flooding into the streets, awakened by the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Elijah McClain. And as we see hundreds, thousands who have gone before, who have been senselessly killed, lynched, we know that our work is not done. And so as I wrote here, as I sat here, I, I wrote a song inspired by those spirituals, written in that form. We will not rest until the storm is over. We will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. It's been a long, hard journey on a winding road. So many have gone before us. They carried a heavy load, but they went there singing as they made their way. Now it's in their footsteps we follow as we work today. We will not rest till mm, the storm is over. Hey, we will not lay this burden down. We will keep each other strong. We will love and carry on till we stand all together on solid ground. I thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for that. And as you can see, we always make a great choice when it comes to our storytellers. Thank you, Reggie. It's now my pleasure to introduce the remainder of our pre presenters for today. So our first panelist uh, that I'm going to introduce is an American political historian, Dr. Daryl Carter, who serves as Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion for the College of Arts and Sciences at East Tennessee State University. Dr. Carter is a public intellectual, scholar, and longtime resident of Tennessee. His specialties are American political history, African American history, and modern US history. He also serves as the director of Black American Studies and Professor of History at East, East Tennessee State. Dr. Carter's well regarded first book is entitled Brother Bill, President Clinton and the Politics of Race and Class, published by the University of Arkansas Press. And he is currently working on a second book, Length Examination of Senator Edward M. Kennedy and American Liberalism. Welcome, Dr. Carter. And Beard Grundy is a continuing community activist and community organizer as well as the daughter of Reverend Luke Beard, who served for 16 years as pastor of 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Anne was the first child of Reverend Beard born in 16th Street Baptist Church while her father was pastor 
and is still considered the baby of 16th Street Baptist Church. I had to put that in there, Anne. During this time as pastor, the church served as the center of community organizing and civil rights activity, even prior to its 1963 bombing. As a young activist, Anne became one of many young people to join Reverend King, Martin Luther King Jr. for the last leg of the 1965 Selma March from Selma to Montgomery. Through her ongoing community work, and continues to inspire students on the depth and beauty of African American history and culture through her work with young people. Thank you, Anne, for joining us and welcome. Completing our panel today is Charles Nebler, a charter member of the SNCC Freedom Singers and a continuing community activist and organizer. And as Reggie mentioned, you saw just a snippet of him at the end of our slide presentation. Influenced by SNCC leadership, Charles Neblett first began organizing direct action initiatives while a student at the University of Illinois in Carbondale. In addition to organizing efforts in Cairo and Charleston, Missouri, where he met Jim Foreman and other members of SNCC at that time, he was recruited as a SNCC field secretary, and in 1961, Charles joined SNCC in organizing Black voter registration in Mississippi and became a charter member of the SNCC Freedom Singers. This group sang at protests, on marches, picket lines, and during sit-ins in over 40 states during the Civil Rights Movement. As an activist, Charles has been jailed over 20 times for his organizing efforts. And he also joined Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1963 March on Washington and in Dr. King's March from Selma to Montgomery. Also, welcome, Charles. Thank you for joining. Today, oh, wow, there's so many things I would like for us to um, begin to discuss. And Anne, uh, everybody can be unmuted now because we want to hear from you in our discussions. We'll just try to keep the background noise to a minimum, but, but I want everybody to be able to join in this discussion. Um, today, we see very, again, young people taking to the streets in protest of what we've seen. And so I thought just to let folks put things in context, our slide presentation talked about 2015. But I think it should be, uh, just to bring you updates, since George Floyd's death at the hands of police on May 25th, 2020, the research group Mapping Police Violence has documented an additional 181 Black people who have been killed by police. So while we're focusing on George Floyd, there have been 181 deaths since his death. Out of that, 966 African... 966 people in America have been killed by police. Of that 966 people, 18.7% have been African-Americans, although we as a people only make up 13% of the nation's population. White victims of police killings make up 37% of all police killings, although they are 76.3% of the American population. So African-Americans are three times more likely to be killed by police than others who are not Black. African-Americans, uh, so 11.7% of the police killings are Hispanic victims, 1% are Native American, and 1% are Asian and Pacific Islanders who are victims of police violence. So those are today's statistics. So as we talk about the civil rights movement, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Charles. If you're looking at television today, in your opinion, how does it compare to what was happening during the 1960s when you were out there organizing? The thing is, you can see it. It's like Emmett Till. It was in your face. Everybody could see it. And everybody was affected by it. And now, it hasn't changed. Things haven't changed. People are still getting killed. The point is, you can see it now. And then they didn't publicize it, but we're still getting killed, and the issues are still the same. 
You know, they never change. You make concessions and they never change. They even like their vote. We were working with voter registration. We were getting killed, shot up, jailed for voting for, 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 for the vote. And here now, we thought we had it. We thought we had the vote rights bill and everything was okay. But ugly, ugly Jim Crow opens up his mouth again. Opens up his mouth again. So what have we accomplished? What have we accomplished? The one thing that we have accomplished, I think, is more people are aware. More people are aware of this. And uh, the more people are aware of it, the better we are. Dr. Carter, this brings me directly to you as a policymaker. I'm sure you can see um, as a historian of American policy. Do you agree with Charles that nothing has changed? We are again calling for more public policy on police reform that you know people are calling for. Can you give us a perspective of policies now? Uh, yes, briefly. I, I will say thank you, Charles, and, and to everybody else for your generation, what you did to uh, help uh, uh, move the ball forward. And on on this issue, yeah, it does, there, there is a feeling that a lot hasn't changed. Um, we are still having these problems. It's almost as if uh, we come up with a policy and, a, and, a, and we have a victory, we get that policy and uh, bad actors find new ways to do the same thing all over again. Uh, we've had uh, nearly 60 years of reforms in law enforcement uh, regarding every aspect of law enforcement. And yet we are still seeing black Americans uh, die at the hands of police officers disproportionate to their population and disproportionate to uh, uh, others across the United States. So my, my sense is that uh, we have a lot of uh, work to do on this, but there are some some bright signs uh, or bright lights there that are, I think, encouraging. One is uh, there's a lot more uh, interest in this now. There's a lot more uh, in terms of white Americans who are angry and disturbed by what they're seeing and don't want it done on, on their behalf, much more so than what you would have seen in the 1960s. Um, you also have uh, a pushback against these things um, on a broad level that is now including uh, parts of corporate America that even if it's just for financial reasons, they don't want to be around it. Um, and this is not something that was necessarily done. You're not going to see, for example, Delta or, or American Airlines or Coca-Cola making uh, moral arguments for voting rights uh, in the 1960s. It's just not going to happen, not, not in that way. But now you're starting to see that. Um, we have a long way to go on these issues, but uh, I am hopeful that uh, in the years and decades to come, uh, we will get much better on this issue. This is about uh, treating people with human dignity and respect, right? They are human beings. And uh, uh, the more attention that we can draw to these types of issues, uh, uh, the better I think it'll be for everybody. And I've got to yeah. come to you on this. Your church, one you grew up in and uh, played in as a child, being the center of this organizing effort before 1963. Can you share just a little bit of your experience of being part of this iconic civil rights monument, even though it's still functioning as a church. Yes, it's very much functioning as a church. Um, so my parents moved from Meridian, Mississippi, in December of 1944, pregnant with me. So they already had a lot of children and they had three more after they got there. And uh, living next door, to the church like that meant that the community saw the church and the minister as a resource. So living there, it was not unusual. Anybody who needed food or housing or their car broke down, it didn't matter what the emergency was, you know, 
people will always say, go knock a red and beer to do it, you know. So early on, my brothers and sisters and I learned how, and this is like one of the non-academic things, but we learned to do it very well, to take notes, to write down someone's name. How can we reach them? What is the problem? We became extensions of the church as a result of living there. But 16th Street is sometimes called the Silk Stocking Church. And by that, it is meant that the people who founded the church had big ideas as to what they would be as African-American people. So a number of the people who founded the church were college graduates. I mean, can you imagine? You know, so teachers around the city, doctors, attorneys, whoever you might call the black middle class in some way or another, their paths would cross with 16th Street. As a result, the children who were in this kind of cocoon, and I was one of them, were early on encouraged to do whatever we needed to do on behalf of the race. We were race people, you know, just like my mom and dad in Mississippi. You never did anything to embarrass Black people. Well, growing up there in Birmingham, my parents constantly reminded us that we represented the finest people on the planet. So for me, you know, they talk about location, location, location. I could not have been born as awful as things were and continue to be. I could not have asked for a better place to be born because my daddy was the natural host of the church. There was a women's organization called the Paraclean Club. These were women like Mrs. A.G. Gaston. Dr. Gaston was Alabama's big multimillionaire. And she was a member of the church and a member of this club. And they took enormous pride in bringing to the city what I call great men and women of the race. So partnering with my daddy and the church and the Paraclean Club, I can see myself right now, six years old, sitting on the front row with my siblings as Adam Clayton Powell Jr. walked across the stage, Ralph Bunch, Mary and Anderson. These were all men and women I knew as a child or I met as a child. And what I didn't know, and this is the value of working with children, I, I've always known it because it happened to me. You never know what an interaction, an experience, you never know what there's going to take, where that would take you. So all of those years I was sitting there with my parents and watching these great men of the race, including the Fisk Jubilee Singers, you know, the Hampton Singers, the Morehouse Glee Club, all of that stuff. Watching these Black men and women on stage, I didn't know that this was feeding something essential in me. So um, take your children to programs. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Well, that goes perfectly with Reggie's theme of reaching out to young people. Mm -hmm. And um, during the civil rights movement, I'm always struck with how actively involved churches were. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In this movement. Yeah. Do you yeah. think, and, and I'll start, I'll take this to you, uh, Anne, but then to Charles. Do you think churches are still the vital connection that they were in the 60s? I can speak personally, uh, the black church lost me somewhere along the way because you know, you black people, in addition to being freedom loving and freedom wanting and all of that, we are also some of the most conservative people in the world. So you can imagine the sixties, we're coming back home with our hair natural and, and wear, you know, traditional African clothes, whatever it is we are doing, the last people to get on board with that were the church people. The folks across the park where Chester and I got married down on Fourth Avenue, the Black Business District, all of the wine old bros and sisters just kind of hanging out. When they would see us coming down the street, 
like that. They were like open and receptive. And I know wine was talking, don't get me wrong. But the point I'm trying to make is that I think the black church lost an enormous opportunity then to kind of be real, if you will. Some churches, some individual churches since then have tried to run and play catch up. But the general experience is that people like me are not necessarily inside the church. Or to put enough another way, we see the whole community as our church. Charles, what do you think? You a lot of your earlier organizing efforts were connected to a lot of these churches. What do you think of today? Well, that's true. Uh, but we had, as I tell you, when we were organizing, a lot of times we had to organize against the church. Yeah. We had to pull, and first of all, the pastors were, they would turn us in. <laughs> they were scared of getting their churches blown up. They were scared. And so we had to organize the young people who were going to that church to get, them, get their parents not to put money in there unless they, unless, unless they turned around. So when they had church, we'd have church too. We had preachers, we could preach, we could sing, we had we had a hang with me. So, <laughs> wow. so what well, happened was uh, go ahead. No, 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 finish, please. And uh what would happen, well, all the kids would come to our, our church. We'd have a mass meeting right there. And we start having mass meetings right there with the people of the church until a lot of times the minister would, would shake his head and, and come to because <laughs> he wasn't making no money. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, <laughs> youth, the youth brought the older people to, to the rallies. That, that's right. That's right. And if you notice, if you notice, look at all those films, the ones that was facing the dogs, the power hoses. What were they? Were kids. Kids. Young children. people. Young people. The children in Birmingham, uh, in, a, in a Selma, and, and it was a children's movement. Yeah, yeah. And when you got down to organizing the ones who went to the cotton fields to organize in the cotton fields and just organize, organize, were young people. The young people. Is that very similar to what we see happening today, correct? I mean, we see mainly it's the young people who have uh, taken the lead. They're the ones who last summer were in the streets every day. Uh, That's right. Being unrelenting in their request for change. That's right. So, so from that aspect, things have not really changed very much. And Reggie, you mentioned being influenced by all of this uh, when you were young. And now I can't imagine uh, Charles seeing you perform this music now. How how were you impressed with, how did Reggie do? <laughs> he did great. I, it brought back old, it brought back old memories. Yeah, yeah. And it's very good. And yeah. I'm glad it's, it's going on. It's still going on. I remember he said something about, he, he was born in where? In banking what? 1952. <laughs> I'm a baby. <laughs> but I tell you, the first, the first time I met Charles, uh, we all gathered in a, uh, uh, a retreat center in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, our friend Bill Harley put together a group, and Charles and Betty Mae Fikes and Hollis Watkins and all, they came. And, and we were sitting across the room from them, you know, with Cordell Reagan and all of us, you know, newbies, youngsters. And looking at these icons and kind of going, oh my goodness, we in we in the room yeah. of royalty. Yeah. Uh, and then we had the the opportunity to sing with them for for three days, you know, creating this record. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was it was really instructive because they we knew they had come through something, and mm -hmm. and their their singing was informed by what they had come through, 
And, and we were just beginning to get energized and organized about going out. And, you know, we, most of us were thinking about, you know, becoming famous or something, you know. And uh, we had, it was the early, early times when I was beginning to see the power of song in organizing and also the power of song in, in teaching people, making them aware of something that wasn't being taught. So I, I, I fully just give absolute and, and total credence to the fact that, you know, these things get passed on. And that's what's happening now. Um, it's a different time. And we have to use sometimes different, um, different ways to energize people. Because, you know, we don't all get together and sing like people used to. Mm -hmm. And we don't, you know, we don't have mass meetings where people come mm -hmm. together and sit with each other for hours mm -hmm. and talk about strategizing. But I tell you this, I've been working with, you know, the Living Legacy Project. And we uh, take young people on pilgrimages and we have these meetings. And I will tell you, the songs still work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, oh, I still work. They People still were work. still using them last summer. Yes, they you were. You could hear some of those songs last summer as they were marching yeah. in the streets and being called the terrorists and whatever other names were being thrown at them. Dr. Carter, what do you think about this call for more legislation? Do you think that's going to really change where we are? See, as you've mentioned, we've had legislation after legislation. Yeah. Well, I, I think it depends on, on which piece of legislation you're talking about. Uh, if we're talking about a more unified approach to law enforcement nationally, so you don't have one thing in Tennessee and another thing in South Carolina, something else in California, then that, that's probably going to be a good thing. Uh, but there are real limits to, to the effects of legislation, right? So, for example, we could pass the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Bill. We do those types of things, okay? Uh, but what we found out is that bad actors find ways around that, right? Uh, people find ways around integration. Uh, people find ways to continue doing bad things um, if they are determined. And so uh, we do have to change hearts and minds and souls uh, and things of that nature. Uh, in order to make progress to go along with legislation. So it's not just one or the other. Both of them have to play a, play a role there. I want to go back just for a quick second on the issue of the, of the Black church. Uh, uh, I'm in my early 40s, and so obviously um, I was not a part of, of the Civil Rights Movement at that time. Uh, but I will tell you that they had some issues that we would recognize today, which is that the older you get, the more you have to lose, right? Uh, by stepping out and taking bold positions on a variety of things. And you still have, if you're talking about 1950s, early 1960s, Jim Crow is still in place. The color line is still right in your face. And so you have black doctors, lawyers, preachers, uh, professors, business people who have something to lose, number one, if things are a little too successful. Now, that's not mean that they, they're not good race people. It does mean that there's a practical side to this. What happens to the black teacher when the schools integrate? The schools are not going to integrate into the black schools. They're going to integrate into the white schools, right? So what happens to those teachers? In countless communities, a lot of those teachers lost their jobs. Right? A lot of them lost their jobs. When black uh, youth who were able to take uh, advantage of those new opportunities start going into, say, historically white institutions and start leaving black communities, what happens to those communities over a period of time? They begin to wither, okay? Uh, uh, they become the fractured. There's some other issues there. And so, uh, you know, one of the secrets that we don't like to talk about is how many uh, black people had great anxiety about the civil rights movement at that time, about the direction of it, what it was going to mean for black families, black communities, if uh, you know all those things became successful. And so we celebrate integration, we celebrate civil rights, we celebrate the march on Washington, those types of things, and they're wonderful. Uh, but we have been struggling in some respects for the better part of 60 years now with, okay, we won these things, but now we've got these other problems that we have to deal with. Uh, and now we don't know how to deal with them uh, effectively. And that's part of what we're seeing, for example, last summer in the streets, right? How do we deal with this? We don't have one unified leader anymore, right? We have a leader and we need multiple leaders in every community. So what I'm saying here is that 
uh, the, the Black community, if anything, has become more complex, right? More diverse, socioeconomically, et cetera, in the 60, last 60 years than has ever been. And now we're struggling, for example, with the interests of the Black professor versus the Black custodian, the, the Black preacher, and the Black business person. Um, and so as we think about civil rights, I, I end on this point. We are not a monolithic group. We are diverse in our own experiences, and we have to appreciate that. Uh, where you know, I think sometimes we think of all of us as just one group, and that's fine. But there's there's a, a rich tapestry there within individual communities within the black community that we have to we have to appreciate and, and celebrate and, and consider as we're talking about these vital issues. You bring up a question that my colleagues and I have discussed on many occasions, Dr. Carter. Was integration good for Black America? Yeah, yeah. Did we lose more than we actually yeah. gained? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> we, we are still trying to figure that, that answer out. I mean, yeah. you know, my sense is, is that overall uh, it, it is a positive. But if you're a part of that one third of Black America that was the most vulnerable, that has not been able to take advantage of all those things, all those open doors uh, 50, 60 years ago, uh, then it may be a net loss for you, right? It may be a net loss for you. Um, and even for those who were able to materially do quite well afterwards, in many cases, statistically, they didn't do as well as their similarly situated white colleagues and peers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have to recognize that as well. But I think it depends on your viewpoint, where you're at. Uh, uh, the sad thing, for example, that I see in, in my own research is that you have people who are participating in the civil rights movement, but long term, we're not able to take advantage of, of the victories. Uh, while others, some of whom were more resistant to what uh, the uh, what protesters, what civil rights uh, people were doing at the time, were able to walk through those same doors that they were originally hesitant to to, to try to blow open. So, it's there's no right answer on that. It's a, it's a complex one, and a lot of us are are trying to figure that out here in the academy. Well, you have you know. W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, talented tenth, who mm -hmm. were able to walk through the door, but the majority of African Americans who uh, were struggling are still struggling. And I was, was that you, Charles, who had a comment? You or Anne? Um, when they integrated the schools, it was my feeling, what I wanted to do was improve our schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They should have been improving our schools, mm -hmm. paying our teachers. Mm -hmm. Because the teachers that I had at the time was mission-minded people. Mm -hmm. They were on a mission, mm -hmm. and they never failed to teach us Black history and tell us we need we need to get you know to do the best we could do, and this thing will be opened up pretty soon. It'll be open up after a while, and we were down in Mississippi, down in, in the cotton fields. Those people weren't doing this for themselves. They were the older people were protesting for themselves. People couldn't read and write. They wanted to make it better for their children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Better for the next generation. They said, I know I'll never do this, but I want my children to go. Well, and, so losing the schools and losing teachers. I can relate to that during my time mm -hmm. in a segregated mm -hmm. school system. It made a world of difference from being educated in a black school and being um, mm -hmm. shipped to predominantly white school where mm -hmm. people did not hesitate to let you know they really didn't want you there. Mm -hmm. right. And they really were not interested mm -hmm. in you learning anything. Mm -hmm. So if you were a student who could sit quietly and not create any problems, you were a good student and they would pass you on to the next grade whether you learned anything or not so i don't think you could get away with that 
when you were in a black school. I know none of my black teachers um, would have ever allowed me just to be a vegetable in the classroom. You know, you really did have to demonstrate learning. So I think from that background, losing teachers, losing schools had a tremendous impact. And I'm also curious about, I don't think you should ever expose young children to that sort of bias. It'd be different if kids were entering school and they were a little older and they could handle things. But when you're young and being exposed to um, those sort of sentiments, mm -hmm. I think it makes a huge difference. So how um, yeah. I just wanted to comment uh, that oftentimes when people hear that I'm from Birmingham, other black people, they will say, oh, aren't you glad to be away from there? And I say, oh my God, just the opposite. Do you know the quality of teachers? I had black teachers didn't have other doors open to them. You know, so if they were musicians or what have you, they ended up teaching school. I'm thinking of one teacher now, Mrs. Murphy, who was my girl, my counselor at Parker High, but she also was a mathematician. She was Spelman graduate, got a master's in math from Columbia. But at the same time that she was going to Columbia every summer, her husband was driving her to New York, she was getting a master's in pipe organ. I don't know personally any white teachers who had that kind of talent in their hands. And as frustrated as Mrs. Murphy probably was, dreams deferred, all of that, I was the recipient, my friends and I, we were the recipients of having this very bright woman in our classroom who taught us more than math, more than history, more than music. So I'm just saying we lost a lot when we lost our teachers. And another thing, our young people had a chance to see Black folk who were in charge. Yes, yes, yes. And now you, you you can't find them. You can go to school all of your life. Never and you see right. very few people in charge. That's right. I said, my school had a black principal and all the uh -huh. teachers were black. And worse than that, everybody in the community knew how you did in school. So hey, you were, hey, raised, that's right. you were pretty that's much right. raised by the entire community. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's true. I would like to just say that one of the dynamics for me was that um, in, after from junior high on, I was going to mostly white schools. And it created a, a dynamic that I was now also living between the two communities. Mm -hmm. So it really has set me up now for what I largely do in life, which is kind of live in this liminal space where I have a, a strong connection to the black community, but I also have most of my work that I'm doing in the white community. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that from you know the end of junior high on, there were about 15 to 20 years that were just very lonely. Yes. There was there yes. was nobody to talk to. There was no uh, there was no organization. There was no place that I found. I was navigating all of this largely on my own or with a few friends that I could possibly talk to. Who were doing the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a it's a tremendous issue um, in terms of negotiating that space, and and a lot of times I was coming under fire from both communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I yeah. wasn't black enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And at the same time, I certainly wasn't white, and so <laughs> that I think is something that has also been uh, a, a just really a challenge. Uh, and I I know that certainly more and more of the opportunities that have opened for for uh, African American and, and you know kids of mm -hmm. color, uh, places them in the same dilemma. Mm -hmm. You know, right. it was nothing for black teachers who were like surrogate parents. Really, let's be for right. real here. Uh, right. To be in a classroom in the middle of winter at Lincoln Elementary, and Mrs. Yancey Davis, a big woman, but pristine, just clean all of the time, and she would sit there and she would say, "Hmm." 
somebody didn't get it right this morning. And she would go, Hubert, Hubert is sitting by, Hubert Dennis is sitting over by the door. Hubert, run down to the gym and see what Mr. Thornton would take the boys for about a half hour. And he would run down, he would come back and he would say, Mr. Thornton says, send the boys on down. So the boys would line up and go down to the gym and play ball or something. When they, those boys left that classroom, Ms. Yan said, Davis would pull out her bottom drawer, take out some sanitary napkins, some newspaper, some alcohol, wash soap, whatever she needed because she understood that so many of my classmates left home and their parents had already gone across the mountain to work in white people's families. And so children were leaving home without breakfast, without being properly clothed, without personal hygiene in place. So our teachers did not hesitate to step in and say, come on, I'll take care of you, I'll show you. Hey, we're starting to get some questions from our viewing audience. And our first question has to do with the impact of social media today. And the question is, uh, do you believe that uh, how it has this sort of social media awareness via Facebook, Twitter, and other uh, media outlets either helped or hindered the modern civil rights movement? Based on some of the comments you've already made, do you think that uh, having more coverage has helped or hurt? Charles, let's start with you and I'll give everyone a chance to respond. Well, it depends on the honesty of the media mm. and the political, you know, some of the media, you get Fox News. <laughs> mm. And, uh, but anyway, that at least at this time that you can see what is going on. And that's you a good thing for people to visually be able to bring that into their living room. That's right. To visually see. And uh, and it's good. And it's good. And but, do uh, you think, do you agree? You know, I'm not the last person you ought to ask about social media. I, I have been slow to kind of gravitate towards it. Um, I am really torn because obviously I see the value in terms of if you compare all of this with the story of, um, of uh, the sister who taught at Alabama State the night that um, Rosa Parks was arrested and they wanted everybody the next morning to um, not ride the buses. This was like the first real Joanne uh, Robinson. Robinson was her name. And she gathered three or four of her best students at Alabama State, got them in her office, and they ran off mimeograph machine. Remember that? The old mimeograph machine? Yes, yes, getting out yes, flyers. Yes. Don't ride the bus. Don't ride the bus. Don't ride the bus. And she had her students then run around all up and down the streets of the Black neighborhood, putting these flyers indoors, in car windshields, and all of that stuff. The next morning, not one Black person was on the bus. I see the value. When I think about something like that and getting the word out, communicating, informing, positioning people and all of that, but it also becomes a devil unto itself. I, I have friends, I know people, that's all they do. I say, come to a meeting, help us write some letters, help us do this. That's what they're doing. So I'm a torn sister, okay? <laughs> Dr. Carter, you deal with young people all the time. And I can only imagine, as Ann is saying, their face is in the media all the time. So has it helped or hurt? It's, it depends on what it is. I mean, there many scholars thought 30 years ago as, as we were starting to embark on the internet era that it was going to be uh, uh, a, a thing that, further democracy by giving everybody a voice. Uh, but the truth is, is that, you know, for it seems like every, for every social justice issue that comes up on, on social media, maybe it, it's to have a protest against police brutality or it's to support <clears throat> a piece of legislation. 
there are literally dozens of others on social media yeah. that are there uh, so that they can figure out how they can more effectively hate other people. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Or how they can commit crime. I'll give you a, ca a case in point. The terrorists that attacked the U.S. Capitol in January, almost every one of them had a smartphone with them and yeah. were, many of them are using yeah. FaceTime Live and other things so that they can show people. Now, call me old-fashioned, yes. but if, when you were committing crimes in the, back in the day, you didn't want people to see it. Now they got cameras, and they're like, look at me. Look what I'm doing. The Justice Department didn't even have to go do real investigative work. Car. They just had to go look at your Facebook feed. That's right. And they're like, okay, yep, yeah, he did it. Yep, yeah, he did it. Yeah. Yeah, he did it. <laughs> so, I mean, it could be a really good thing. The Arab Spring, for example, social media was the, the, the catalyst for that, right? It can be a it can be a really really good thing, but all too often it seems like we're seeing it used for hate, disinformation, mm -hmm. uh, to confuse people, misinformation, uh, to sow distrust, mm -hmm. uh, crimes, perverts, you name it, uh, have, have done that. And then we have <laughs> corporate actors like Facebook, which I use Facebook. But at the same time, corporate actors like Facebook who are uh, you know basically encouraging the worst people to use their products because the algorithms that they use okay. are extremely valuable to their net worth, right? Mm -hmm. So Facebook is making billions of dollars mm -hmm. off of advertisements, mm -hmm. right? Tied to how their products are used by the public. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it's a, I think it's a net negative in a way, but on the other hand, I'll tell you this, you can't organize the March on Washington over you know, uh, 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 you know, in the same way with social media, you could do it in a couple of days now. Mm -hmm. A couple of days now. I mean, you yeah, have you, you have you have ten or twelve people. You handle you handle the buses. You handle hotels. You do this. Everybody get on social media. It, it'll be done in just a matter of a few days. You didn't need that much that much time. Um, uh, you wouldn't have had these secret meetings and private meetings between the big six and President Kennedy, because each one of them would have said, Mr. President, we're going to go on Facebook here if you don't agree immediately. Mm -hmm. And the White House would have said, yeah, yeah, we're supportive of it, right? I mean, <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a net negative right right now. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Reggie, how about you? you? You reach out to young people, and I know young people are attached to their media. Has it been effective? It has been, and I think I think Dr. Carter hits dead on. Um, you know, a lot of times when these uh, new things come up, we, we realize that you know, in every generation, there's new in, new technology yeah. that comes. Yeah. And, you know, the civil rights movement figured out that you know, don't hold your you know your big event at two in the afternoon because the new me news media is not going to be there. Hold it at five so they can put it on, you know, and yeah, everybody can watch it at dinner time. Um, and you know, you have to, you have to, you know, become technology proficient and efficient in figuring out. Uh, the the young people that I interact with, they talk about platforms that I have no idea where they are, and and where they're going, and they are absolutely and totally fluid, and they look at you like, where are you? You know, you know. and I realize this is not, this was not made for me <laughs> right. they're not they're not talking to me so i i do my facebook i do my twitter and i but what i try to hold in mind is the old things that we know as is true of history still have value mm -hmm. so we just have to not get all excited about the rush of the new things so that we end up talking about it. i think dr Carter, you made such an important point I tell my audiences and, and my, my folks all the time, everybody doesn't want peace, freedom, and justice. <laughs> and they're working 24 seven to make sure you don't get it. Right. So you have to remember that all these things that we're doing have a counter side. Yeah. And so the media and social media, all of those things, there's a counter to what it is that we want to see on them. Mm. And if we get ourselves upset and you know get our shorts in a bunch, and spend so much time trying to tell how bad this thing is, we lose a lot of energy. So I, I just thought, decided years ago, I wasn't gonna spend my energy there. I'm gonna use social media to, to do exactly what we're talking about. I'm gonna let people know things. I'm gonna make them aware of these things. Uh, I'm gonna invite them into the process 
so that we could have conversations there and other places. And then with the young people, I, you know, when I had them on the bus and they had their earbuds in, and I'm thinking, I don't know whether they're really listening to me and, and, and singing. I told them, you may be listening to something else, but I want to see your mouth move when we're singing these songs. <laughs> and, and, you know, and they kind of roll their eyes and they do whatever they do. But I tell you, by Wednesday afternoon, the songs had seeped into them. And when we were in Selma for a, a day of work and, and, uh, and, you know, getting out in the neighborhood, those same young people, three days after I taught them some of those songs, used them when they had an open moment to work with some kids. And the songs are easy to learn, and the background of the song energized them because they said to me, why don't we know this stuff about this history? And so I said, well, you can go on internet and look it all up. And they did. I have one, one viewer who wants brutal honesty from the panel. And the question is, what can white people do to help continue the modern civil rights movement? And they want you to be brutally honest. So if you don't think they can do anything, they want you to be able to say that. So who wants to start first? Charles, we'll come to you. What can white people do to help the modern civil rights movement? I think white people, one of the best things that they can do is organize white people. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Amen. Uh, Everybody... I want to add that one of the, the, the very best things white people can do is to have an honest examination of their own history in America. It is not pretty, and it is the very reason. All of this stuff is structural. What that means is it began back then with the Europeans, the good pilgrims, the good born agains coming here. We have to ask ourselves a simple question. Where are the first people, the native people to this land? What has happened to them? So I always say white people do mirror work. Hold up the mirror tell the truth, and then you will know yourself what to do. We won't have to tell you. Dr. Carter, you're there in East Tennessee State, and you've kind of made the national news um, over some issues there. So what would you say to this viewer? How would white people help? I think white Americans can help by number one, uh, not tolerating bad behavior on the part of other mm. white Americans. Mm. Okay. Um, all too often, we will see people say, well, yeah, so-and-so said the N-word, but I don't do that. Mm. Well, no, you need to be having a conversation with mm -hmm. that person who did say the N-word. Mm -hmm. You need to be talking about it with them. You need to make it clear that, that it's going to be a pretty frosty environment for you if you continue this kind of behavior. Um, uh, I like to see, you know, a lot of more white Americans become very active in punishing others who are promoting hate of any kind. So, you know, one of the things that I've noticed because of the social media thing is that a lot of these bigots are, are losing their jobs. Good. Good. I hope you lose your job. If you're promoting hate, of any kind against any group, any person, then I then I hope you lose your job. So that's that's part of it. Um, the other thing that I would like to see is for white Americans to stop being so sensitive. Okay, because yeah. every, we try to bring up this stuff like the the just the math on it on how often okay. black people get pulled over by police across this country, how often black people get the death penalty compared to whites for similar crimes and actions. You know, there's this sensitivity, you know, thing of, well, you know, golly gee, I didn't do anything. You know, no, it, it, I didn't accuse you of doing anything. Mm -hmm. You just have to recognize this exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's a problem here. And then we can take steps to, to, to move forward on, on this. And so, uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, and I, and I tell students this, it's not just Black Americans, for example, or Native Americans or, or Latino Americans who are suffering because of 
these types of things, white people themselves are suffering. Mm -hmm. They're dying because mm -hmm. of their own mm -hmm. bigotry. Mm -hmm. And what one person talked about, one scholar went off and talked about dying mm -hmm. of whiteness, right? They're killing themselves. We're mm -hmm. seeing, for example, in the last 12 years in Republican yeah. districts across mm -hmm. the United States who were the most opposed to people like Barack Obama and the most in support of people like Donald Trump are disproportionately suffering mm -hmm. a variety mm -hmm. of issues mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. They're so committed to it that, that yeah. they can't see the forest for the tree. So, you know, there's a self-interest here that white Americans need to also recognize is that the, the, the hate that they think is so valuable is actually killing them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that white Americans and, and one of our viewers wants you to back away from your camera just oh, a little I'm bit sorry. so they can see all of you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, I'm I sorry. Go I go ahead. One of the things that white Americans can do because it's coming. Start to share the wealth you have made off the back of black people, brown people, red people. Find a black college, you know, Talladega, you know, Alabama State, Morehouse, Feldman, Hampton, we everywhere, and begin to give your wealth to these schools because that's a group way that we can lift up the race. Mm. All right. Um, I have a question directed directly at Dr. Carter, who says uh, about the ETSU basketball team kneeling event, do you believe things have gotten better in the following weeks? And would you consider this part of the modern civil rights movement? I think it is part of the modern civil rights movement. And if we're going to be honest, I'll, and I'll tell the public, you know, I am a two-time graduate of ETSU. I came back here as a faculty member. I love the institution, met my wife here, my, my kids have grown up on the campus, but we have had problems. Every year we've got some damn issue mm -hmm. on this campus, mm -hmm. uh, from people wearing gorilla masks uh, mm -hmm. to the basketball issue, uh, to you know more isolated events that don't get public uh, uh, dis the dissemination. Uh, yes, we do have our problems. I do have confidence in the administration uh, and President Nolan, uh, uh, Look, the administration made some mistakes. We got to recognize that. But I think that the president has done a good job in terms of approaching various groups on the campus in the weeks after with two things. One, an acknowledgement that, that they screwed up. And secondly, an honest searching for answers of how they can do better. And as a faculty member, as a tenured professor here, as a, as a middle manager in, in the college, um, I, I felt really good about the discussions I had with the administration, specifically the president, about the direction of the institution going forward. Um, finally, you know, I can't help but love this place. I, I've been around here a long time, quarter of a century altogether. Um, I've seen a lot of progress on this campus in that time. Um, we are a better campus than what we were 25 years ago when I was a freshman. Um, but we still have issues and it's, we have to work on those issues. And we have a lot of people on the campus who are eager to help with solving those issues. Does it mean everything's perfect? No, it doesn't. But I am proud of the institution, even though like anybody else, they, they disappoint me from time to time. Um, but this is a great place to be, uh, even though we do have issues. And so I would encourage, you know, uh, uh, people to take a real good look at us, come to campus, uh, come see us, things of that nature. Uh, but it's incumbent upon our administration as well to drop that hammer on bad actors when they pop up. Alcine, could I, could I tag yeah. into that last question? Sure. Um, I thought the panel gave some really amazing answers for what white people can do. And I just wanted to say, uh, as, a, as a summation on that, uh, white people, when you hear something from a person of color that just makes you either crazy or confuses you or, or stirs up something that you have an answer for, don't give it. <laughs> Write it down <laughs> and go do some research on it. 
<laughs> Stop being so quick to give an answer that you think addresses the problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I, had a white, I had a white person say to me, she just realized that white people need to come sit down and shut up more. Shut up. Shut up. As you heard from our panelists, yeah. <laughs> do some work on your end before asking a black person the question. And uh, Charles, I'm going to direct this question to you. And I, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to try and get as many answers as possible. Has Black Lives Matter, having that hashtag and using that, has it been helpful or do you think it's been more detrimental to allowing other people to join in? I think that it's truthful. Mm -hmm. People came out with a blanket statement and said, yeah. Black lives matter. I'm black. Mm -hmm. Black lives matter. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of the time when black was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Then white people got into a hissy about it. Yeah. You know? And I, I saw buses where they said, yellow, like, the yellow is beautiful, brown is beautiful, white's beautiful. It's like it was, it was a attack on white people. Mm -hmm. And you said Black Lives Matter. And how can you not understand that? And I, I'm really suspicious of people who get into a hits and fit about their title. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not, not anything people should fear. This is no. where they might want to do some research, as Reggie is suggesting, mm -hmm. on, on why yeah. that statement had to be made, mm -hmm. yeah. right? That's right. And Certainly, if you watch uh, today's PowerPoint, you can see a long history of why that why we feel yeah. that way. Amen. That's right. And That's right. white people uh, need to really understand that... Uh, you're right. We're not talking about you. We are affirming ourselves and that there's something that hits a raw nerve in this country when black, brown, red people begin to stand up and assert themselves. So I think whiteness has a lot of homework to do. A lot of homework. A lot of that's nothing but fear. Guilt yeah. and fear. You're right. You're right. Guilt and fear. Guilt, guilt and, and fear. fear. You get rid of some of the guilt by giving to some HBCU. <laughs> <laughs> and bringing out that community activist profile right there. <laughs> Support those black schools. Right. Well, believe it or not, we have come to the end of our time for the, with this wonderful panel. And uh, I want to thank each of you for agreeing to talk to the public today on civil rights and share your experiences. Uh, this is our 11th public uh, discussion. And next month, June 12th, is our last public discussion. I was mm -hmm. tasked with developing 12, and June will be our 12th public discussion. And then uh, you can revisit these um, incidents on Facebook, YouTube, International Storytelling Center. But this has been a wonderful NEH project, and I really want to express my uh, gratitude for each of you for agreeing to join in. And hopefully, if you did, if you missed anything today, you get to replay it, do some research on your own, and some reading. We have the toolkit that goes along with us with the um, Freedom Stories, which is available online at the International Storytelling Center. So to all of our guests, thank you for joining us. And I hope to see you in June for our final uh, Freedom Stories public discussion. Please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again, Richard. <laughs> <laughs>